welcome to the Ringer NFL show. A special front end of this episode as Steven Ruiz and I watched that Bengals Ravens game and we recorded a podcast earlier previewing week 10, but we said we got to come back on and talk about that football game. A classic Ruiz. These two have played two games this season. Both games have been among the best games anyone's played so far this year. But the Baltimore Ravens have come out on top on both of those games just when I thought, man, the Bengals might only be one game behind the Ravens in the AFC North. No, the Ravens get the win 35-34. Bengals fall to four and six. Ravens improve to seven and three. There are probably 400 different things we can discuss from this game. Where do we start? What, what, what is on your mind minutes after that game ends? I mean, I guess we should start with the last play of the game. I don't know if yeah. you want to start with the two-point decision to the, by Zach Taylor to go for it and you go for the win instead of playing for overtime or the non-calls on the... the I, I guess there was contact with uh, Joe Burrow's face mask. I don't know if it was grabbed, but there was definitely forcible contact to the head or neck area, which could have been called. Uh, and then it looked like it could have been called defensive holding as well. I think the defensive holding call was more obvious than the uh, the brush against Joe Burr's face mask. It at least had more of an impact on the play. But I, I, I don't think we have to debate Zach Taylor going for it there. He just watched his defense give up, uh, you said it, four touchdowns in a row. Yeah. Uh, and the only way they really got stops in the first half was via penalty or, or negative plays by Baltimore. They got stuffed on a third and three run, which I thought was a questionable call. They got uh, set back behind the chains by a couple of uh, penalties by the offensive line on the other drives. But outside of that, they were just moving the ball up and down the field. So I would not have left it up to a coin flip, whether Lamar Jackson gets the ball back or not. Yeah, I'm with you. So, so the Ravens finished the game with four straight touchdown drives. Bengals are on the ropes. They're down by a touchdown. They get the ball with a minute 49 left. They get to fourth down. Uh, Joe Burrow, it's Andre Yoshivas for a, a first down. And from there, they just start rolling and they go right down the field. And then uh, you mentioned it. They score the touchdown. Great throw, great catch to Jamar Chase. And they line up for two. And at first I'm thinking, are they just going to try to draw them off sides? And if they get the off sides and get closer, then they're going to go for it. No, they were lining up, look at seeing the look, calling timeout, and then they actually do go for it. And listen, I hate talking about officiating generally. It's like any game, you can talk about it, a call here, a call there. However, I do think that's going to be the story from this game that could just because of that last play and just because of how well both these quarterbacks played and it was a classic and now it ends on a play like that and Mike Gesicki gets held like you mentioned and then Joe Burrow gets kind of a, a strike to the helmet there uh, at the end doesn't complain at all wasn't like what you know whining for for a call or anything like that he was just seeing if the ball got completed it didn't but Terry McCauley the you know the officiating uh, expert for Amazon comes on right as the game's ending and says both of those should have been called. It was strikeable contact uh, to the head, to Joe Burrow, and then a holding on Mike Gesicki there. In the end, and what was interesting, Ruiz, is that Al Michaels, you know, who has been calling these games for a long time, he kind of went after NFL officiating yeah. at the end of the game. I, I think that was a big surprise. I think people are going to be talking about that, where he's saying this happens way too often, where games are decided, calls are missed, uh, all these things. So yeah, again, who knows what happens if they score there? I mean, Lamar Jackson's getting the ball with 38 seconds left. Does he drive into field goal ring range and they kick a field goal? Entirely possible. I'm not saying that's definitely, you know, they got robbed and they, you know, there are other plays in this game at the same time. I think that will be what everyone's talking about after this game. Yeah, it will be. And that's a shame because the football was spectacular. Incredible. Uh, both quarterbacks were incredible and both quarterbacks basically had to carry their offenses because both run games were non-existent. That's not, uh, surprise with Cincinnati. That's usually the case with them. And it's usually on Burrow to kind of move the offense up and down the field. But the, for the second time this year, the Bengals really sold out to stop the run and they've, they had some success against Derrick Henry, but it didn't matter because Lamar Jackson is just a freak of nature right now. He's just unstoppable. Uh, I, I don't know what you do about it. Like how many times did it seem like they were going to sack him and they had him in the pocket or, or Trey Hendrickson had him from behind and he just, Got out of the way, and, and sometimes it turned into a big play, like the uh, the crazy scramble down the right sideline. Second yeah. time he's that's not even the the best play he's made down the right sideline against the Bengals <laughs> this season. That's how ridiculous this season has been for Lamar Jackson. I'm referring to the, the the touchdown throw in the first game that we all lost our mind to. But yeah, he just he just avoided sacks so many times, and sometimes it ended up with like a throwaway or just like a check down for not much yardage. But 
avoiding those negative plays was such a big deal because the offensive line and his teammates couldn't stop committing pre-snap or not pre-snap penalties, but penalties that set them back on first and second down. I I thought like had the Bengals ran away with the game, which I I thought that's what it looked like in the third quarter after they go up 21 to seven, I probably would have come on here and been like, yes, I'm worried about the defense, but not so much about the offense. Like, you know, when they didn't have these setbacks with the penalties, they moved the ball just fine. But luckily I didn't have to come on and say that because Lamar Jackson uh, wasn't being held back by his teammates over the the second half. Uh, But yeah, this game's about these quarterbacks. Uh, we talk about the Mahomes and Allen rivalry, but this this is this might be the preeminent quarterback rivalry just because they're in the same division and we're going to get these matchups two times per year for the next decade. I really can't wait to watch. I I, I need to look up what their combined stats are for the the two games because I know they both like just blacked out in both games. Yeah, it's rare that you get the two games that live up to the hype. Yeah, it was it was funny. You know, the bank, the the Ravens, like you mentioned, the first half they're kind of kicking themselves, uh, you know, uh, shooting themselves in the foot, I should say, and just they can't get anything going. Then it's twenty one seven in the third quarter. Bengals are up. Burrow hits Chase on that sixty seven yarder, and Kyle Hamilton's out with an injury. And you're going, all right, this, you know, it looks like this probably going to be the Bengals night. And I think if you're a Bengals fan, yes, you're going to complain about the call at the end. But man, there is just, I felt like before that, that they were giving this game away. Chase Brown with the fumble. I mean, they're driving up 21-7. You score there. You're taking time off the clock. Great play by Marlon Humphrey. But that's a fumble. Uh, Ravens come back and score, change it to make it 21-14. And then that Tylen Wallace play, Ruiz. I mean. Oh, my God. Like for as the Bengals exceeded expectations that defensively in the first half, again, it wasn't all them, but you're like, wow, they're actually stopping the run and stuff that you you just can't have that play at that time. You pin the Ravens at their own eight worst case scenario. You're making them drive like 10 plays, 12 plays, taking time off the clock. uh, And you don't do that. You give up an 84 yard touchdown to Tylen Wallace. The one thing you cannot do in that situation. And all of a sudden it's 21 20 right there. So I thought those two, plays just entirely you know that completely changed the game and then from there they were just exchanging haymakers like you mentioned Lamar Jackson we've had game games this year where we've been like oh uh, you know he's just the offense is working for him he's operating in structure this was kind of like old school like all right get go get the cape I know you got some injuries you're dealing with but the tiptoeing on the right sideline there was a third and six on that touchdown drive where it's just like that's hard it's a muddy pocket and we just take it for granted he's throwing a jump yeah. pass over the middle <laughs> on the money away from the defender. It's a seven yard gain. It's an incredible seven yard gain. And then even the touchdown, it's like, it's not an easy throw. Like he's going to his left. He's, and then he's putting a little, little sauce on it. Uh, as, as some might say, and just a right in, right in the receiver's hand. So, uh, he was incredible in this game, finishes this game, 25 for 33, 290 yards, four touch. Did not, he didn't take a sack Ruiz. No. I'm looking at the box score. I didn't realize that. No, this guy never takes sacks anymore. Like you have to get him on the first drive. And if you don't get him on the first drive, you're never going to get him. That's how it's been all year. And the Bengals didn't get him on the first drive. So they didn't get him all game. But okay. I just looked at the stats. Uh, these are, this is Burrow and Jackson combined in these two games, 17 touchdowns, one interception. Oh my God. Uh, 67 uh, completion percentage combined 8.6 yards per attempt. That's crazy. That's just insane. It's crazy. Yeah. And like, I mean, it's not like it was easy for either uh, quarterback. It's not like, you know, they were running the ball well, they were calling play action. No, this was like hard, high degree of difficulty quarterbacking. And like you saw them, and I think I, I said this after the, uh, the week five game, like you saw them quarterback and like navigate this game in their own special ways. Right. But the end result is the same. And I think like th- that's why I'm like so bullish about this this current crop of quarterbacks we have. I know there's been a lot of talk from like Tom Brady about how oh we're not developing quarterbacks because the transfer portal. I just look at the, the the talent at the top, like Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, yeah. uh, uh, Josh Allen. CJ Stroud, Justin Herbert, like even guys like Geno Smith and, and Trevor Lawrence can have their days. Dak Prescott, uh, like Jalen Hurts was an MVP candidate the other day. Even the system quarterbacks have like perfected the art of being a system quarterback, like a Jared Goff. Uh, you could say Brock Purdy has like taken that to a different uh, level from where Jimmy G had it. I, I just think we're in such great hands. And I think this like quarterback matchup is the best illustration of where this league is headed at this position. 
Yeah, I love the styles point because we know Lamar Jackson is a, is a true one of one. We have never seen anybody play no. quarterback like him. And then Joe Burrow, the way he was climbing the pocket, keeping right. his eyes downfield, just getting crushed in the pocket on some of these throws. That throw to Chase on the last drive on the left side where he is getting killed. And it's like that ball's right in. He could have walked it to Jamar Chase. And that's like a 20 yard completion where he's getting a roughing the passer where he's getting hit up high and down, and down low. Uh, 34 for 56 to your point, they weren't even trying to run the ball, and rightfully so, I guess. But 34 for 56, 428 yards, four touchdowns, zero interceptions. Jamar Chase on another level in this game, 11 catches for 264 yards. The only other sequence here, I like so it was for the Bengals, that Chase Brown fumble was one. The the Tylen Wallace uh, touchdown was the other. That last play, the officiating. But then they had that third and two and that fourth and two where it's 21-20, and they throw go ball right sideline, go ball left sideline. And I don't know if that's just Burrow thinking, I've got a matchup. I'm going to hit this right now. I, I can't imagine those were the designs of the play. But man, third and two for to try those two low percentage throws. When you have a chance, you're winning the game there. It's 21-20 in the fourth quarter. If you just pick up a first down and extend that drive and score there, uh, you're in a good spot. They don't. And then Lamar and the Ravens come right back. He beats the blitz, throws a touchdown to Mark Andrews and 28-21. Ravens there. So yeah, that that was the other sequence where I thought, yeah. man, that that's probably one it feels like they want they want back. I mean, I, I think that one's on Burrow, but I, I also don't think it's like like the situation is bad, but you get cover one, you usually want the slot fade, and he took the slot fade in both instances. What the, I think the first one was to chase, which makes more sense. The second one yeah. is the one that I can't explain. Yeah. Jermaine Burton, especially after the week he just had right. uh on a game deciding play, basically. I, yeah, I, I thought that was a bad decision by Burrow, but like the guy dropped back like a billion times and, and it like had no margin for error. So I, I'll excuse that one mistake. And even the yeah. mistake he made in the, the uh, red zone where Brandon Stevens couldn't get his feet down. That was that was a questionable decision. I, uh, I think uh, Kirk Herbstreit said he he was fooled on the play, thought it was made. I don't think he thought it was made. I thought he thought the cornerback would stay low and he would be able to get that throw over the top. And he, he just wasn't able to do it. Uh, the Bengals had their missed opportunity with the Cam Taylor Britt play. Uh, yeah, that's that another what if for Although them, that man. Would have been, that would have been that would have been a great interception. Yeah, that would yeah. have been a great diving interception. Uh, but yeah, they there there were a lot of moments that could have swung this game in either way. That's why I think it's gonna like the face mat or whatever you want to call it the the possible roughing the passer call yeah. on the two point conversion and the possible defensive uh, interference call. Like that, those are one of many plays that could have gone either way. Like if you think about the beginning of the drive, it was fourth down. And I, based on the replay, I didn't think, uh, I, I forget who the receiver was. Was it Yoshivas? Yoshivas. I don't, yeah. I don't think he got the first down. I think his elbow. No, really? I thought short. he did. It was close. I thought he did. It, but, it was, but it was, I was very close. Yeah. But I was team content there. Team rule of cool. Like just let it go. Yeah. I want to see where this game is going. But like, yeah, there is a couple of like 50, 50 decisions. I don't think we should focus on that. Let's focus on the fact that this was the, like one of the coolest yeah. football games of the season. And like what we we just witnessed these quarterbacks do. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. Yeah, it, that I agree with you. That's easier for us to say. If you're a Bengals fan, you're like, no, I know there were other plays, but this came down to the last uh, play there. But the, you started with it. I'm fine with going for two there. There's no great yeah. option. Usually, if there's that much time, 38 seconds, there's usually like a cutoff for some of these teams where you only go if it's under a certain number because you don't want the other team to have time to come back and kick the field goal, even if you get the two-point conversion. And I think this one was probably right on the border, maybe more time than you would typically do it. However, it was either that, like get the two and then hope you can stop them from kicking a field goal or it was kick the extra point and then like they still have a chance to drive and kick right, the game winning yeah. field goal. And even if they don't do that, now you're up to chance with a uh, coin toss going into overtime where if you don't get it, I mean, are you going to stop them from scoring again? They scored touchdowns on four straight possessions and it didn't look like your defense had it there at the end of the game. So I have no issue with it. Um, you know, you, you have to pick, you have to pick something in that spot, but this Bengals team, man, four and six on the season. I don't think it's not over for them. I'm going to keep saying that until they're mathematically out of it. When you can play a high level game, like they just played against a team that we've been calling the best team in the NFL so far through the first half of the season, like you're always going to have a chance. Now their margin for error, every time they lose one of these games, it shrinks and it shrinks and it shrinks. And eventually 
You know, you, you might have a bad call in week 13 and that might knock you out of the entire playoff race. But we were looking at the standings um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the show. Like, you know, there are going to be potentially some wild card spots up for grabs here. So uh, they're not out of it. They're four and six. And if you look at it right now, the last wild card spot is the Broncos and they're five and four and they've got the Chiefs this weekend. So hang in there, Bengals yeah, fans. Yeah. You're I mean, Burrow, I don't think Burrow's ever played better. He's been on fire the last three weeks on the season. Fifth in EPA per play, uh, fifth in success rate. I love that they got the explosives going today because in the first half, it was like, man, all right, they can string together these 12 play drives, but at some point you need the explosives. Yeah. And then Chase just kind of takes over um, with a couple monster plays. So they can't run the ball and the old line's a question. <laughs> The same as it ever either. was. <laughs> I know, but it's just when you're quarter, when you get a quarterback and a wide receiver like that in a passing game that uh, is capable of shredding on any weekend, you always have a chance. But can they put it together for the final, you know, stretch of the season? I don't know. Yeah, but their season comes down to next Sunday uh, against the Chargers. I think they that game mm. got flexed to Sunday night. Am yeah, I right that's about right. That? That's uh, right. If they lose that, because that's a key team in the wild card race, the Chargers, who I think are going to be in that, they're going to be vying for the same spot as the Bengals in the wild card chase. Maybe though the chart, they both could potentially like looking at it. Now you could leap the Broncos and the Colts and still get in as the seven. Yeah. So, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm really interested to see how this works against the best defense in the NFL statistically and a team that's been very good about taking away explosives. So this could be a very interesting matchup in the next primetime game. The Bengals are they, yeah. They're still a fascinating team. They're the most yes. fascinating four and six team in the league. Although that might change because if the Jets win, they're going to be four and six and they're going to these two teams are going to be locked in, uh, or leveled, which is kind of amazing considering how the Jets season has gone. Yeah, it's basically these are the teams vying for two playoff spots in the AFC. Chargers, Broncos, Colts, Bengals, Jets. Everyone else either has uh, six wins or more or, or two wins or fewer. So yeah, it, that sounds like a segment for us coming up on a future show. Which two, which two teams is it going to be, be? Maybe we'll make our picks uh, on, the, on the Sunday night show. There's a very good chance that the AFC field of quarterbacks could be Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, CJ Stroud, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, and Joe Burrow. And then Russell Wilson. <laughs> yeah, it could be that could be the that could be the group. Wow, what a group! What what a playoffs that would be. Imagine replacing Russ with uh, Aaron Rodgers, though. Yeah, that, that would be an intrigue. insane field of quarterbacks. Maybe the best ever. Maybe the best in the history of the sport. Yeah, again, that sounds like another segment we'll probably do at some point. All right, we had to jump on talk about this game. Bengals fans, hang in there. It's not over yet. Football fans, awesome. Thursday night game. Lamar Jackson continues to be uh, in the driver's seat for another MVP as far as I'm concerned, as far as Ruiz is concerned. All right, we'll take a break here. We come back and we will get to the week nine, week 10, week 10 preview. It is the preview show. Big storylines, matchups, picks, all the good stuff, Deontay. How are we feeling going into week 10? Feeling great, actually. You know, I, I think after going back and watching the film, I can maybe walk back the fact that I know exactly how this season is going to end <laughs> the way that I came on to the Sunday show. Um, but I think that we are we are approaching these inflection points with a lot of teams, you know, not just the two win teams that I think we've all been dismissing over this past week. But I think a lot of these teams that are hovering around 500 we're going to start getting the points in the schedule where they see divisional opponents. And I think things are going to get pretty clear for where things will land when we get to the home stretch. Yes, Ruiz. How after this weekend, I mean, we're past the halfway point. This is the home stretch kind of. Uh, yeah. The, the playoffs <laughs> are their own beast though. You got another like five weeks of, of, Work, I guess is what I, I have to say. <laughs> work analysis. We have to keep coming up with takes. No, no, I'm excited. That's the best time of the year. This is the best time of the year because I think we can really start to hone in on the teams that matter and we can ignore some teams that don't matter. We don't have to talk about the Panthers like I had to do so much over the first month of the season. That's right. The draft order will come into uh, come into picture as well here in the weeks that all these two win teams. I mean, a lot of draft order to be sorted out here. All right. First segment, we talk about the three biggest matchups of the weekend. We're starting with Sunday night because we have the Detroit Lions going to Houston to take on the Texans. Lions are three and a half point favorites on the road. Houston Texans are six and three. First place in the AFC South. But I think as we'll get into, 
How much do we believe in that record? How much room is there for improvement? What's this team going to look like uh, down the stretch? So Ruiz, why don't you uh, start us off? What do you find most interesting about this matchup as the Lions go to Houston to take on the Texans? I just think it's what's being asked of the two quarterbacks. And I think just seeing how these offenses have set their respective quarterbacks up for success in Houston, it really hasn't happened in Detroit, especially over the last two weeks. Jared Goff, his A dot is 3.5 yards over the last two games. And they've scored 76 points. Ooh. He's had a scramble once in the last month and a half. He's had a scramble once, just one time. Uh, 45% of his throws are coming on obvious passing down. Uh, that's one of the lowest marks in the league. So he's been playing on easy mode for the last couple of weeks. And to his credit, he's been playing perfectly in that that role. He's barely uh, thrown an incompletion. But on the other side of things, it, it's the opposite. Because C.J. Stroud is still being asked to do so much to lift up the, this offense. The, the running game still isn't working. They don't have any easy buttons in the pass game on early downs. Bobby Sloak really hasn't figured out a way to replicate. Even what they did last year when they when they called a little bit more play action, they were a little bit more effective at it. They're still kind of effective when they go under center and run play action on, on first down, but they don't do it nearly as much as they did a year ago. And we've also seen some personnel changes. Last year, they were one of the heavier 21 personnel teams, two backs on the field. This year, they've eliminated... Uh, they've wipe that from their offense and they've replaced it with two tight end sets and it's not really working uh and neither are the 11 personnel sets especially in the ground game Deontay who do we because I as I was preparing for this game and we've I feel like we've been talking about the Texans for a long fairly since week one uh on this pod and they I really think they've been one of the most underachieving units in the NFL when you look at it they're 23rd in DVOA I feel like I've had a little bit of shift personally from ripping Bobby Slowick to it's hard to live in a world with this offensive line. I, I mean, you watch this offensive line and I don't know if it's fair to call them like one of the worst coach units or if it's talent or what, but it isn't like the most complicated stuff that's tripping them up. It's simple stunts and other stuff that they can't get blocked up and Stroud's being pressured on over 41% of his dropbacks, uh, the fifth highest rate in the NFL. So when you look at this Texans offense, uh, are you more slowic? Are you more offensive line? Is there something else that kind of gets your attention? No, I mean, the offensive line has been the issue, and, and I'm with you on that. I, I think part of the reason why I haven't been coming back to these podcasts week over weeks, pounding the table about how Bobby Sloak is a problem, though I do think that he has his share <laughs> of blame in this, is because this offensive line is just not playing at a viable level. Laramie Tunsil has not looked as good as he has when he's healthy in years prior. Um, you know, that has been a major concern. And then the interior of this offensive line has been about as bad as you'll come across in the league when you look at how they play on a down and down basis, right? Like that Packers game where they were just giving up quick pressure time after time. Like that reminded me a lot of that Thursday night game when Lamar Jackson was just getting blitzed to hell by Brian Flores against the Dolphins. And there was just no time for them to get the ball out. So that is one piece of it. I think on the other side, and this goes to kind of Steven's point, is that if we are going to look at Bobby Slowick, you have to start questioning why there aren't different ways for them to keep um, C.J. Stroud protected, whether it's leaving chip help in instead of trying to get as many guys out in the route as possible. I thought that was a big issue on Thursday. Knowing that your quarterback is uncomfortable in the pocket, you continue to try to get five guys out in the route. Or if you're not five guys out in the route, you are trying to push these routes far downfield in a way where you know your quarterback is not going to have time to access the entire progression. So I think there's a confluence of events happening there, but all of it really starts with the play of the offensive line, especially along the interior. How much does that fall back on the coaching staff, though, especially when we're talking about them like failing to pick up stunts? And like that's been a common criticism of this coaching tree is the lack of sophistication or options in the pass protection uh, area. And I think when you watch the film, that kind of checks out. But I, I, I agree, like, like Deontay said, it's multiple factors. The offensive line hasn't been good. I don't think Slowick has been able to work around it. Uh, that doesn't mean he's, he's doing a bad job. I think you, re you need a really good coach to be able to coach around this type of offensive line. But I do think he could be doing more, and there's uh, different buttons he could be pushing. And I, I think part of the problem is us in a way like people like us who last year looked at their early down run rates and we're like they're doing too much of this why are they running the ball so much they're wasting so many downs and 
yeah, they were wasting those downs, quote unquote, but they were setting up play action passes that that made it worth it to burn those downs. Now you're not doing that so much. You're putting it all on Stroud and he's faced the most uh, too high looks this year. Uh, zone too high. He has the most dropbacks against that on early downs in the NFL this year by six. So I, I think you could lighten his load. You can make his degree of difficulty come down just a bit where he's getting more single high. He's getting more cover three, cover one, more uh, run looks from the defense, which makes it easier to pass. I mean, I'm not taking any more. responsibility from slow Deontay. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, re- I will reject that through and through. I stand by every take I had in August. Well, and I will say like, well, I think that I, I do think that maybe there was a little bit too much time spent on them needing to run less and more. Maybe we need to talk more about them needing to run effectively. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I, and you know, there is kind of a balancing act that you have to do with that as a play caller. I do think that when we talk about being a play caller, raising the floor of your offense, when you talk about Detroit on the other side, the thing that they do a great job of, Minnesota does this as well with Kevin O'Connell, is that you avoid third and obvious altogether by trying to turn first down into first down. We don't see that with yeah. this offense yeah. often enough. Right now, they they have the most dropbacks in the league on third and four and more. So that everything beyond like third and three is basically an obvious passing situation. So the fact that they're leading the league in, that, in those um, situations tells you that all defenses know is that they have to win on first down and then you can get into your exotic stuff and because this offensive line is playing poorly you're not going to be punished for getting into those mugged up looks those bare looks running those twists and stunts being able to play a little bit more split safety zone shells where you can show bodies um, in the middle of the field where you know CJ Stroud wants to attack so that to me I think it, it's it is a combination of factors but all this comes down to early down offense and when they're when when um excuse me, Bobby Solick and CJ Stroud are on the sideline. I can't imagine how jealous they're going to be looking at Jared Goff and Ben Johnson just turn first and 10 into second and four, second and three, or moving the chains and not being stuck in those high leverage situations against uh, an elite defense of their own right with Houston. In addition to leading the league in those third and and four plus dropbacks, Stroud on his passes, he's facing the highest average distance to a first down on second down. So second downs are throwing it, are turning into third down environments. And then obviously third down hasn't been easy either. So I I think that's part of the problem with the offense too, is that when they ask Stroud to drop back, it's happening when the defense knows it's coming. Right. Yeah. It's uh, I I'm fully converted on the, Third down numbers are kind of overrated because the great offenses just get to third down less uh, than everybody else. They're thinking first down right away. Uh, You mentioned those two high looks, Ruiz, and and his performance, uh, the performance of the passing offense is very different against those this year and last year. Last year, he was seven. That's why it was driving me nuts last year because he was seventh in success rate uh, against two high zone coverages. This year, he's down to 25th in success rate against those coverages. And to your point, they're seeing um, all over the place. Let's do this little exercise. All right. Let's say you swapped out Ben. All right. So right right now, the Texans offense is 23rd in offensive DVOA. Let's say before the season, they did a little bit of a swap. Ben Johnson for Bobby Slowick. Don't ask any questions. There might have been blackmailing or something going on there. We, We don't know how it happened, but it happened. Where does this Texans offense rank in efficiency? And keep in mind, my second question is going to be if you switched out the offensive lines but kept the coordinators the same. So that's the exercise. So first question, everything else stays the same. Nico Collins injury, everything else. But you swap out Ben Johnson for Bobby Slowick going into week 10, Ruiz. The Houston Texans don't rank 23rd in offensive efficiency, or maybe they do. They rank where? I would say like, I don't know, 16th. I think I called... uh... Ben Johnson, the offensive line merchant on, on the midweek show. So I, I, I'm kind of locked into an answer here. I, I kind of have to say that uh, Houston would only get marginally better, but I do think he would find answers in the run game. I don't think it would look like what it looks like in Detroit without that offensive line and having like the opposite of that offensive line. But I do think he would find a way to get the defensive looks to pass against because he's done that in Detroit. I know they've had the strong offensive line, but it hasn't always been like this. It hasn't always been elite. It's we've seen it kind of gradually progress to this, this year. And 
we've seen defenses throw different pitches at him. Like last year, like the first year when golf really exploded, they were getting a lot of like fire zone blitzes, a lot of cover three, a lot of uh, looks that are easy to pass against, hard to run against. But last year that kind of changed and defenses played a little more too high against them. They, they, uh, sold out to stop the pass a little bit more than they had the year before that. And he had answers for that too. And now they've gone back to playing the single high and, you know, trying to stop the run game. And he has even more answers than he did two years ago. So I I would have faith in him finding something that works, especially with a quarterback like Stroud. What about you, Deontay? Ruiz says 16 if Ben Johnson is coordinating this offense. Can I change my answer? I'll go 12, 12, 12. Okay. Well, I'm glad he did that. So that way we don't end up in the exact same spot. I was going to say about 18th, 17th, 18th. Like, I do Uh think that this offensive line is a barrier to having a top 10 offense. Even if you do have a great play caller, I do think to what Steven's saying about having answers, you probably get more condensed sets. They probably spend more time doing under center, you know, whether it's downhill runs or trying to find even the things like Tampa Bay does where they'll put Bucky Irving in the slot and then run a jet sweep just to see if you can get like some cheap, a cheap explosive that way. I think that you would see a little bit more of that from this offense. And then I think you would get more screens, more RPOs, more quick games things that just protect your quarterback from all the pressure that they're under. I think to to the second half of your question, that's where I think it gets a little bit more interesting, where if you kept the coordinators the same and Bobby Slowick could run his offense behind Panay Sewell and and Tyler Glass and you know and the rest of that offensive line, I think now you're maybe talking about a top eight, top ten unit if everybody's healthy. But not a top okay, three that's unit, which I think you would get if uh if you put if you gave Ben Johnson CJ Stroud, I think you would get like a top three uh, offense, definitely a passing offense, which I mean, Jared Goff with is it, kind of getting close to that. With a with a good offensive line, you're saying though, both. Yeah, yeah, saying, with a good no. offensive line. Okay. Yeah, but what if you line. gave, if you gave, okay, gotcha. But if you had gave this, the Lions offensive line to Bobby Slowick, then where are you putting them? I think, yeah, I would agree with Deontay. I think bottom of the top 10. I don't think it would be an elite okay. unit, though. Yeah. I don't I think he, he would maximize it like like Ben Johnson has. Ben Johnson has maximized not only the offensive line, but that personnel in general. Like, Amon Ross St. Brown, yeah. his usage is just ideal. He's getting yeah. open. It's on, on every third down, it seems like he's not only single covered, but uh, the motion, the the formation is providing some type of advantage to get even more open than he would have been. I think we all land in a similar place. I think the offensive line is the bigger issue and will give them a bigger bump. I still, I think if you just swapped Ben Johnson and didn't do anything else, yeah, I'm tempted to still say they would be top top 10-ish. I don't know. He's, he seemed to have answers for everything in Detroit. Not a lot of people were looking at that Detroit infrastructure. I remember when he was hired, I'm like, who is this guy that Dan Campbell's promoting? And now all of a sudden, you know, they, they have a top five-ish unit every season, but I I think we land in a similar place there. I'll tell you what I would love to see Sunday night in this game is just like CJ Stroud remind everyone how good he is just in these hard circumstances, just find a way to be creative and kind of put on a show uh, against this Detroit Lions defense on national TV. Cause I'm not looking forward and and none of us it's telling. I, I feel like a lot of podcasts would have this conversation and CJ Stroud would be taking more heat. I just think we all land in the same place that this is not on CJ Stroud. CJ Stroud is awesome. And that uh, he still has some monster games in him this season. Me and Deontay were talking about this before the recording, but like Thursday against the Jets, that was the first time where I watched him this year. And I was like, he's, he doesn't look that good. And I think it's a reaction to what he's been dealing with. And I think it's a reaction to what you're talking about, like him having to be more creative and you could see him kind of in between two worlds there and hesitating his, his footwork was off. He was missing throws. He doesn't typically miss. There's still like a sprinkling of elite high level throws. The one that Robert Woods on the sideline is, is the one that stood out to me. But you could see it start to take an effect on him, which that's yeah. concerning. Yeah, he was getting, I mean, yeah, he was getting crushed in that game. But then on the times when he wasn't getting crushed, you're like, wait, are bad habits um, you right, know, yeah. starting to form here? So that, yeah, that's why I hope Sunday night, I hope we don't see that. And I hope he plays really well. We'll see what happens in that game. We didn't talk much about the Lions offense because we no. talk about the Lions offense every week. They're awesome. I don't know. There's a lot to say. We'll see what this Texans defense looks like. They've played well, but Will Anderson has not practiced uh, the yeah. last two days. So if as he's not Deontay there, told us. Yeah, yeah, if he's not there, it's going to be a... I, 
This Detroit might nasty. score 40 yeah. points because <laughs> I think the key to this game is uh, Houston's defense creating the same environment for Jared Goff that C.J. Stroud has been dealing with. And I think they, when they're healthy, they have the horses to do that. They, they lead the NFL in negative play rate. So on first down, they can get you in second and 13. They can get you in second and nine, second and 10. And we haven't seen Detroit have to play like that the last couple of weeks. And I, I would be interested to see that. But without Will Anderson out there, who is one of the league leaders in pressure rate, one of the league leaders in like get off uh, time, according to NFL Pro, it, it, the defense looks different. Yeah. No, no, no doubt about it. Up front on both sides of the ball, we'll we'll see uh, what it looks like. If you're the Lions, you're like, this should be an O-line you should be able to get after, but you don't have Aiden Hutchinson. What does your pass rush uh, look like? So there's a chance that C.J. Stroud, you know, has some protection in this game. And then you mentioned it. The other side of the ball should be strength on strength. Will Anderson, Daniil Hunter, D'Amico Ryans against that O-line and Ben Johnson. We just don't know if we're going to see it all at full strength here. All right, uh, let's take a break here. And come back, we will get to the next two games on our schedule. Welcome back to the Ringer NFL show. All right, next game, Niners at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, the Niners are six and a half point favorites on the road. Christian McCaffrey going to play in this football game. And as I was preparing for this episode, I realized I think I've talked myself into the Niners going on a run here. I, I want to hear uh, what you guys think, but I'm looking at it and it's like, man, they've had so much stuff happen this season and they're four and four and no one's run away with the division. Everyone's between four and five and five and four. They're the only team with a positive point differential. Now you get Christian McCaffrey back. And I think two of the biggest issues with this offense, and we've talked about this offense a lot, but one of them is uh, the explosive runs have not been there like they would be with Christian McCaffrey on the field. And the other one is red zone, where they've been a bottom five red zone team in the NFL. If you like look at those things and special teams, you can explain away a lot of the losses that the 49ers have had this season. And so I look at it and I'm like, all right, you don't expect Christian McCaffrey to come back and fix everything, but it's kind of like, well, he could fix those things uh, pretty well by himself for being a massive upgrade uh, over who you were playing at running back. And those guys did fine, especially Jordan Mason uh, for a backup, but he's not going to be Christian McCaffrey. So I look at this team and they're actually fairly well positioned right now. I'm not positive it's going to happen for him, but Ruiz, I feel like this is a team that a month from now, we're going to be look at it and be like, oh, the Niners are the favorites again, or, or among the one or two favorites in the NFC. Yeah. This is why I hesitated to kind of count them out when they were looking bad a couple of weeks ago, just because like Christian McCaffrey's return was always a possibility. Now the question, it's not so much, is he going to play? It's, is he going to play like he did last year? Which is, right. I think it's a big question that he still has to answer. And we have to see, but I'm with you. If it is the 2023 version of Christian McCaffrey, he solves all of their problems, which has been one beating cover one. He did most of his damage as a receiver against cover one, 10 EPA, uh, Total, he's just had one EPA. That means he was negative nine EPA against every other coverage. So, like, that's going to solve the man coverage issue that they've been talking about all year long. And then the other thing is they're seeing less cover three and seeing a lot more quarters. Guess what? The the second most effective coverage uh, Chris McCaffrey played against last year it was it was quarters. He was the uh, the quarters beater too, and he averaged six point six yards per carry when defenses were in quarters. So it helps them in the run game against quarters. It helps them uh, in the pass game against man coverage. And to your point, in the red zone, he's the guy. So it's going to solve almost all of their offensive issues. And that's really been the difference between Brock Purdy this year in terms of his his production, his EPA numbers, his success rate, and last year. He's kind of settled into the same numbers that we saw out of Jimmy G and his best years in San Francisco before they got Christian McCaffrey. So I do think if they get, they drop Christian McCaffrey into this, like the all pro version of him, we're just going to see them return to last year's numbers, which was the best offense in the NFL. Yeah. For what me, do you think, I mean, Deontay? The story of this is what, not only what Christian McCaffrey does to teams in from a coverage perspective, it's what it allows Kyle Shanahan to do on early downs, period. Because when Christian McCaffrey was on the field last year, you could not be in an eight-man box against his offense, even if they did have heavy bodies on. It was the lowest percentage by far on runs for them last season 
um, seeing eight man, seeing a percentage of eight man boxes. It was 44%. His average has been 51% since he's been the head coach of the 49ers. And what that means is light boxes for defenses, heavy bodies for Kyle Shanahan are explosive run opportunities. And that to me was the thing that separated that offense from everyone else last year was the fact that they could change gears in between spread offense and just picking on mismatches between Brandon Ayuk as an X receiver or Christian McCaffrey underneath against the linebacker or safety. And then if they wanted to get into these condensed sets or these heavier sets, you still had to honor the threat of play action because of what they could do in the passing game. And that meant that Christian McCaffrey could get to the edge and pop a big run at any point in time. I think that this is a perfect time for Kyle Shanahan to be getting his running back back as you know, last week or not last week, but after that um, Saturday night football game, against the Cowboys. It was like, okay, in the second half, you see them get into more yak offense, more quick passes for Brock Purdy, trying to simplify things in the drop back passing game. If they had that come to Jesus moment in the passing game at the same time as you are getting your best player, your best offensive weapon back into the mix offensively, that is going to work wonders for them on early downs. And I think that we'll, we'll probably be dismissing a lot of the problems and crises that we were talking about this offense ha- having throughout the first two months of the year. If McCaffrey is anything like what he was last season. And it's a good point that it's a big if Ruiz because I, yeah, I do sometimes, I'm speaking for myself, you fall into the trap of this guy's back. He's going to be the guy he's always been. But he was going to wear Germany. Well, yeah, I mean, Germany. Germany. It's always bad <laughs> so, when you're going to Germany. Times, yeah. Uh, there's got to be some site that has a double like, Achilles injury. I've right. never heard of someone hurting both Achilles yeah. <laughs> simultaneously. And Achilles, like one of the most significant, uh, you know, injuries uh, in the NFL, one of the hardest ones to come back from. So you have an Achilles injury, you're going to Germany. We don't know, you know, this is, what is this? I guess Panthers version was like 1.0, 49ers version was 2.0, post-Germany version of McCaffrey's 3.0. What what this 3.0 version of Christian McCaffrey after getting whatever he got done to the Achilles in Germany, what does that look like? If it's even... 75%, honestly, of what it looked like last year. Uh, I think the Niners are going to be in really good shape, but you don't know what's the workload going to look like. What's he going to look like three weeks from now, or even right away? Is it going to take a ramp up period? So those are all questions we don't have answers to, but uh, you know, I, I think they're in pretty good shape. This Niners team, all things considered this, the year from hell, the Super Bowl hangover, all those things to be in this spot now uh, going into week 10, uh, you know, you, you got to, kind of like their chances. I was also looking up Purdy's numbers just against uh, Todd Bowles because he's faced this, this Bucks defense each of the last two years, and the Niners have had a lot of success in those two games. So uh, we'll see if that continues in this game. 49ers go to Tampa as big road favorites, six and a half points. All right, last game we're getting to here, Steelers at Commanders. Commanders are two and a half point favorites. We decided let's just pose a real simple question. It's not quite a plant. I guess it is kind of like a plant your flag uh, from the Sunday show. But basically, which team do you take more seriously? I mean, these are arguably the two teams that have overachieved. I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anybody, but uh, they're right there with any team that's overachieved so far this season. But do we take them? Are they cute little stories that I'll sneak into the playoffs? See you Saturday afternoon, wild card weekend. All right, you're done. Go ahead on vacation. Or is there more to them than that? So the question we're posing is, which team has a better chance to win a playoff game? That's all. You don't have to win the Super Bowl, win a playoff game, be playing in the divisional round. Deontay, who do you got? Steelers or Commanders? I'm taking the Steelers because I just trust their formula of winning football games a little bit more in a playoff setting than I do the commanders. Um, I think that when they're healthy, you know, in the acquisition of Preston Smith, I'll start on the defense side of the ball. The acquisition of Preston Smith really probably matters most for them over the next couple of weeks as Nick Herbig is kind of nursing this hamstring injury. Um, and I know that they've had issues with Alex Smith, Alex Highsmith being in and out of the lineup as well. But when you think about them having their full complement of pass rushing talent, the growth that they've had in the defensive secondary around Minka Fitzpatrick, bringing in veterans, Joey Porter Jr. getting a little bit better, all the tight man coverage and pressure that they like to send, and what Patrick Queen has been for them in the center of this defense, I trust that they can make, they can kind of muck up any game defensively and keep it close enough to where those Russell Wilson moon balls matter a little bit more. 
And so far, obviously, the variance has tipped cr like crazily in the, in the Steelers' favor. I don't know if that's going to last all season, but I do think if they're able to continue to push the ball down the field with the amount of one-on-one -on -one opportunities they get, if Mike Williams stays healthy, and I know I'm laying out a lot of qualifiers right now. <laughs> you start talking about Mike Williams' health and Russell Wilson being able to be clean in the pocket and be effective as a decision maker. I do think, though, that they have just enough between the run game, explosive pass, and a dependable down-to-down -down defense that they can probably upset. They're more likely to upset a team in the AFC than I see uh, Washington winning a playoff game unless they were at home. Ruiz, what do you got? Are you with Deontay or not? Did he convince uh, yeah, you it, if you weren't? No, I'm with I'm with him. I, I would take Pittsburgh. And I, I looked up all of the, like, the traditional measures of luck that we typically associate with luck, like point differential. Pittsburgh has the better point differential. Per game, eight point five to eight point two with Washington. One score games. Pittsburgh's only three and two. Washington's four and one. And one of those includes the hail mary against Chicago. It's only a one game difference, but it is a difference. Uh, turnover differential. Washington is plus five, and Pittsburgh's plus ten. That that favors Washington. You would expect that to regress to the mean, and those teams to come closer to the middle of the pack. And then fumble recoveries. Washington is first on offense. They've recovered eighty five percent of their fumbles, and Pittsburgh is nineteenth. So I, that heavily favors Pittsburgh and suggests that Washington has some regression coming there. And then the last one, which I think is the most convincing, obviously the records are similar. Pittsburgh has the better strength of victory right now, 44 uh, win percentage for the teams they've beaten, while Washington's is just 34%. So I think by the numbers, you almost have to go with Pittsburgh, but it's more complicated than, than that. The commanders, I think, have the better quarterback, even though it's a rookie. Yep. Uh, but Pittsburgh has the better defense. And I would argue out of the four units, you know, Washington's offense and defense, Pittsburgh's offense and defense. Pittsburgh's defense is the the one I would trust the most to continue performing like this. And I think the uh, the thing that it really comes down to is which OC do you trust more, Arthur Smith or Cliff Kingsbury? And for me, I kind of lean towards Arthur Smith. You just gave Cliff the hardware <laughs> this week. What are you talking? You just gave him the assistant coach of the year award, and now you're our, two days later. My gosh, what? it wasn't just the, it wasn't, to the curb. It wasn't assistant coach of the year. It was assistant coach of the first half, and we're talking about That's second. Half. You're right. You're right. Okay, so you were not. You are not believe predicting. You found a way to wriggle out of that. Unbelievable. <laughs> oh, no, Watch out. You get into a relationship with the guy. This guy just kicks you to the curb. <laughs> Two days later, Cliff Kingsbury thought, you know, we're in a good spot. Finally, Ruiz used right, to flush the first, first half place. take. That was yeah. the first half take. You have to flush all your, your uh, all of your takes at midseason and, and, and get a new batch of takes. Now, now I'm all anti Cliff right. for the rest of the. Uh, right. now you're I'm going to take Wario. <laughs> <laughs> you're the page. Uh, unfortunately, you're both wrong. The answer is I, I Washington. I mean, this is easy. I thought we were all going to trust the Dan Quinn defense at your yeah. own risk, buddy. This well, is why I brought yeah. the numbers. I thought you, they would compel you. No, no, they they didn't compel me uh, at all. So, uh, one very simple one. You know, I let you go by the eye test a little bit. One guy's got a one team's got to play an NFC team, and another team has to play an AFC team. I mean that that is very simple to me because we're talking about just getting out of the first round of the playoffs. I, I, I'm glad you brought up the point differential because I do think for both these teams, maybe in our heads or in people listening, it's like it's fluky. It's not going to last. Like all the metrics are like, no, these teams have been very good. It doesn't mean they're yeah, going yeah. to be, but even if you DVOA, the Steelers are 10th, the commanders are seventh. You mentioned the point differential. They're both in the top five in the entire NFL. The Steelers, one of the things I like to look at is just who has not been like blown out. They have not lost a game by more than a field goal this season. Like that again, Tomlin, that's why he's coach of the year at the midway point of the season. But if we're looking forward, I like the commanders uh, for two more reasons. One is because yes, the quarterback, and maybe he can't sustain it the rest of the way. It would be remarkable if a rookie quarterback just kept playing at this level. But from what I've seen so far, big edge to the quarterback and sometimes football in the NFL uh, is that simple. So I go Jaden Daniels over Russell Wilson and then strength uh, of schedule coming up. So you mentioned the strength of schedule in the past, and that's fair to point out that, hey, maybe the Steelers have a more impressive resume, but Steelers have the fifth, uh, oh, they have the second hardest schedule remaining in the NFL if you just go by kind of the betting markets and, and how each team is rated, whereas the commanders going forward, they have the fifth easiest schedule. So they have a much easier schedule than the Steelers 
coming up. Now, you could get the Cliff Kingsbury collapse. You could get the rookie yeah. coming back down to earth. The defense, no, I don't trust them, even though they got Marshawn Lattimore. I get it. The Steelers are getting a little healthier. In addition, yeah, I think you, I can't remember if you mentioned Zach Frazier uh, or not Deontay, but the rookie center who played really well, yep. he's expected to come back. I just think the commanders, the commanders have a better shot to me to win their division than the Steelers do. Ravens are still the, actually neither of these teams are favorites in their own division. The Eagles are and the Ravens are, but I think the commanders have a better path to getting first place in their division, maybe getting a home game early on. So that's my case for the if, commanders. If I'm, the commanders if I'm the commanders, I'm praying for that. And I, and I understand what you're saying in terms of like, is the NFC team versus an AFC team? It's entirely possible that the way this thing breaks, breaks down that if the commanders are a two seed, that they could be seeing the Packers. They could be seeing yeah. the Vikings yeah, true. in the first round. If the playoffs, if the playoffs okay started with. today, they would be playing the Packers in the first round. And I, I know who you would be taking in that game, Shield. <laughs> the Steelers so, would be playing the Chargers, a team they've already beaten they've by 10 points. Beat. Yeah. Wow. All right. No, that, now that's a good point. That's making me rethink the wow. Look at me. I'm wrong. Look at this AFC picture. The Broncos are the seventh seed. Yeah, the stinks. Chargers are the sixth seed. <laughs> yep. The Jets are right gonna, now. The Jets still might make the playoffs. Yeah. No, that's it. I will. I will take that as a. Yeah, I'm wrong about that. I was thinking of the best teams in the AFC, yep. but that's not necessarily the team that the Steelers would play in the first round. But it, and if the Commanders could see the Eagles in, in the wild card, depending on how things break out. If break you down. flip the yeah. result of the 10-9 rain-soaked Broncos Jets game. The Broncos and, and Jets, there would be one game that separates them in the standings, or what, a, a half a game. Like the Jets are yeah. still very much. Wow. That's how weak. It, think about how the Jets have played this year. That's how weak the bottom of the AFC uh, playoff picture is right now. Like I, I'm a big Justin Herbert fan. Obviously, I think he's playing MVP, top five MVP level football. But uh, I don't expect him to win a playoff game this year. Yeah. But they've got six teams. Six teams in the AFC with two or fewer wins. So if you don't, if you have more than two wins, you're basically still in the mix. Yeah, you're still alive. Exactly. But I will say this, Pittsburgh is not going to hold on to that three seed. <laughs> Let's be serious. Yeah. Probably. I don't know. I'm tired of just saying Tom is going to the year. Tomlin doesn't finish above 500 and he can't get away with this. He's not doing it again. And now here I am looking at the standings going into week 10 and they're right under the Chiefs and the Bills, six and two with a better point differential than the MVP of the league in Lamar Jackson. It's crazy. I will they just say find a way. If they come out of this, the last two months of this year with double digit wins, Mike Tomlin needs to be unanimous coach of the year because they've got to see Baltimore yeah. twice. They've got to go on the road to Cincinnati. They've got to see Kansas City on a uh, Christmas day. There, there's a lot of tough games coming up for this Steelers team. So if they're able to weather that storm throughout the rest of November and they're still in good shape come uh, the second half of holiday season, then yeah, I think that this is clearly going to be Mike Tomlin's best coaching job. And if they win, if they win against Washington, which I think is a big if, I, I would pick Washington in this game next week. Baltimore and Pittsburgh, the that could be for first place in the division, and then you also have KC and Buffalo. I think like next week, week eleven is going to tell us a lot about what the the AFC playoffs are going to look like. Yeah, if Washington piles up wins, you could probably still make the case about well, you know. Fifth easiest schedule the rest of the way. If the Steelers come out of this thing still in first place in the AFC North, they're going to have like one of the most impressive resumes of any team yeah. in the NFL. It's wild to think about. Russell Wilson, will he be doing it uh, in December? That's why I picked the commander. See, now you feel better about my pick for the commanders when I laid it out <laughs> that way. All right, those are the three big games. That's going to be a fun one uh, this weekend. Steelers at commanders. Commanders are two and a half point favorites. We'll see. Can they block up the Steelers front? I think is probably the biggest question uh, in that game. All right, take another break. We come back. We get to the picks for week 10. All right, we're back on the Ringer NFL show. You know what we do every week. We make three picks. Can be anything minus 120 or better odds. Whoever is in last place gets assigned the slop game of the week. Can you hear the sadness? Why, why the somber tone? She yeah. what, what's in the my matter? voice. Before my us. voice. Maybe you can hear it. That person has to watch the you know, worst game of the week and talk about it on Sunday night. I was 0-3 last week. Ruiz was 2-1. Hey, hey, I was, was actually 3-0. Three three I had to correct Dave Comer before the pod. because. Well, I might have been 3-0 too. If Comer no, got no, yours I, wrong, who's to say he didn't get mine wrong? No, I, we just had a mistake. He thought I had the uh, uh, over on Tua Tagovailoa's longest pass, but I had the under 
I was touting oh. the Bills defense for that pick. Wow, he doesn't. Uh, I was actually well three and zero last week. So let's okay. set the record straight. All right, three and zero. I'm sure he probably. Listen, we love Comer. He probably fixed that, and I probably didn't even see it. All right, so Ruiz was three and zero. Deontay was three and zero, and I stunk it up at zero and three. I am now twelve and fifteen. Deontay is fifteen and twelve. And Ruiz, what are you? Nineteen and eight? Is that right? That's right. That's right. Which means the fall is but coming. Sir it's going to be record. Yeah. I'm going to lose. I mean, I'm going to lose like nine days. You should be hosting the Ringer Wise guys. Somebody make a call. They don't. Nobody there has 19 and eight on the season. Those are crazy numbers. Unbelievable. What can I say? I'm just. I'm just a humble analyst. <laughs> Ruiz doesn't want me to say too much because then I'm jinxing it. He knows the he says the, he knows no. the regression's coming, so that's why he's not speaking too much when I say that. No, there no, you go. I coming. respect it. It's the right move. All right, now you two gave me uh, Giants Panthers in Munich at 9:30 a.m. Eastern on a Sunday. Uh, I filed a complaint with HR that this is. <laughs> inappropriate behavior <laughs> by my colleagues. And so, uh, Deontay, it's not clear whether I'll actually have to watch that or not. I'm waiting to hear back from the fine people at Spotify HQ. Isn't it, isn't what they say is that as long as the appeal is in the air, you still got to go through with, with, with the original ruling. So I think as of now, I, I'm glad that it's you and not me because I can tell you for certain if I had to be up that early to watch that game, you would probably not hear much analysis from me. Um, yeah. But we've got some other slop games of the week if you want to trade it out. Mm. No, yeah, yeah, you're right. When the appeal, uh, there's the appeal, then you still have to watch the slop game because it's not resolved yet. All right, I try. A morning so. slop game is pretty good, actually. It's a morning slop. I mean, you're, you have it on in the background. You don't have to watch it while there are other better games going on. It's not, you know, cutting into that That's time. True. If I was on the West Coast and had to wake up for, at 6.30 to watch Bryce Young and Daniel Jones duel, uh, not happening. I'm sorry. That you is true. I can do the old start it. Yeah, no, I don't want Saints Falcons. No, thank you. I can do the old start at 45 minutes late. Fast forward to the commercials. You're finished just in time for the early window. All right, I'll do something like that. All right, let's get to the picks this week. So this week, you know, most weeks I'm looking at my my 10 picks that I tweet out and I just pick three. Not this week. I said, it's time to switch it out. I've got three that I like. I'm feeling good. You know what? I'm just going to start. I'm going to keep talking and I'm just going to start. I'm feeling so good. I'm going with Jonathan Taylor under 81 and a half rushing yards. This is a good one because if I win it, I win it. If I lose it, I can blame Ruiz because Ruiz has been telling us for weeks, rightfully so, that this Colts running game is way worth way worse with Joe Flacco than it is with Anthony Richardson. And he is absolutely right about that. I was looking at their success rate with Richardson on the field. It is in the top five in the NFL with Joe Flacco. It would translate to the 32nd ranked rushing attack in terms of success rate. As big of a gap, basically, as you can have. And as we've talked about, a lot of that has to do with Richardson's threat as a runner. So, Bills have been pretty good uh, against the run so far this season. Not great last week against the Dolphins, but pretty good over the course of the season. So, you got that. You got the stats we just gave about Flacco and Richardson and what their run game looks like with Flacco. And then the other thing is, this Bills offense... It can just be like, it's weird. They could just throw it three yards last week. They just average pass went 3.7 yards. Yeah, we'll dink and dunk, methodical down the field. And so they can do that again. That seems to work pretty well against Gus Bradley. So maybe the number of possessions in this game are shrunk. So Bills go to Indianapolis. Uh, Bills are three and a half point favorites in that game against the Colts. I like the under uh, Ruiz, Jonathan Taylor rushing yards, which is 81 and a half. Yeah, I'm going to follow you on that, but I'm actually going to go with Bills minus five and a half. I'm going to take the alternate line to make it a plus 105 just to, you know, as a tiebreaker. But I, wow. I, think, the Bills, I think the Bills Feeling are just going to... himself. Yeah, I think the Bills are going to blow them out. I don't think this is going to be close because yeah. I think of, there's a mismatch on both sides of the ball here. And I had the same numbers as you with the, the run game with Anthony Richardson off the field. <laughs> Not only 32nd in success rate, 31st in EPA per attempt, 31st in uh, yards per rush. Uh, th- this run game is just unviable without that that option threat in the backfield. And we've celebrated Shane Steichen as a play caller and his run game. It's been beautifully designed, especially in Philadelphia. We saw it was good last year when Richardson was out there, but it's always had that, that mobile threat in the backfield who could pull the ball. And Joe Flacco is not that threat 
Although I would very much like to see Joe Flacco uh, run a couple of zone reads, <laughs> a couple uh, keepers there. That would be fun to watch. But it, I don't know what he does. I don't know how you work around that issue. And then we've talked about the the pass game issues. The offensive line hasn't been that great. The receiving core doesn't really create a lot of separation. They haven't been great at the catch point. And Joe Flacco's success, which was, I, I think, overblown, it was, it was minimal, has been based on third down, unsustainable third down performance. He was the best quarterback in the NFL on third down coming into Minnesota game. And Brian Flores ate his lunch and it, it looked unviable. Uh, Flacco looked terrible on third down. And I would expect that to continue against a disciplined defense like the Bills that can stop the run on first down and then get you into obvious passing situations where I think Joe Flacco will struggle. I may or may not be on some group chats where I'm sarcastically saying, are, are we delaying putting Shane Steichen into the Hall of Fame now, or are you guys still <laughs> putting him in, in his first year uh, of eligibility? I can't comment. I cannot uh, confirm or deny that those texts may have been sent uh, from my phone looking at what's happening with this Colts offense this year. All right, so we both went Colts Bills there. Uh, Deontay, what do you have? What's your first pick? This one felt like, this one feels like easy money to me. I'm going Falcons three oh, and no. a half. It's always no, dangerous, Deontay. Be careful I now. I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm relying on relying on an NFC South team in a divisional game. I, I understand the error in my ways going into this, but there's just no way that there's going to be much life left in this Saints defense against the Falcons offense. That's third in the NFL in, in rushing success rate between you know the dynamic uh, the dynamic speed of, of Bijan Robinson and then obviously having a hammer in short yardage situation in Tyler Algier. I think that, you know, and I've been noting this over the last few weeks, I love the way that this offense has kind of struck its distribution of touches. I like the way that Kirk Cousins has looked when he's been clean in the pocket. I think, save for that Seattle game, you've seen him work really effectively, um, understanding when to get the ball out, trying to, you know, mix it up with who he gets the ball to, pushing the ball to Kyle, Kyle Pitts in a way that was kind of here, uh, hit and miss earlier in the season. So I think if all those factors are available to them, and I expect they will be without Marshawn Lattimore playing for the Saints anymore, I expect them to really be able to move the ball at will on Sunday. Yeah, uh, the Atlanta Falcons have famously never let anybody down who put their faith in them. That's a, that's a very smart. This is <laughs> don't know what why, you're talking about. This is don't how I built my about. lead by not be betting on the Falcons and betting on the Bills sure. instead. Now, are you aware that Saints players are wearing Mary Rismus shirts for new interim head coach Darren Rizzi, the possible uh, new coach, the interim coach bump that we see from time to time? The quotes out of New Orleans are hilarious. Like. The players did not hide the fact that they were just done with Dennis Allen last week. And now they're just like, oh my gosh, this Darren Rizzi, this guy is going to lead us to the promised land. It was like he had this quote that they have a quote activation period before practice to help prevent players from getting hurt, which I believe is just like dynamic stretching. Are you talking about like, a dynamic warm-up? Going- yeah. yeah, what it's was going warm-up. on in New Orleans, DA? What are we doing, man? It's like, it's like the littlest things they seem to be celebrating. I don't know. I'm a little, I would be a little worried about the new coach. You stay, you stay ready. You don't have to get ready. That's Dennis Allen's uh, thing. No warming up. Warming yeah. up's for losers. Put it on I t-shirts guess. with Riz on them as NFL veterans. I might take an alternate line on this <laughs> just to stretch this out. That not not honorable <laughs> on New Orleans's part. All right, listen. If the Saints win, I don't know. Can we get we, can we get Deontay a Mary Rismus shirt by the Sunday night show? I don't know. Yeah. I, if the Saints cover, I'll, I will wear a Mary Rismus shirt. I was, I was looking for a David Carr prop because I think uh, Derek or yeah, David. Derek. No, Derek Carr. Did I call okay, him David? I wasn't sure. Uh, uh, but I was looking for a Derek <laughs> Carr prop because I feel like he's going to have a reaction to Michael Thomas slandering him on Twitter. He's going to be like, I'll show you who's afraid to throw. And I think he's going to like try to air it out against the Falcons. I don't know if it's going to yeah. work, but I think he's going to try. Weirdly, yeah. Weirdly intriguing game. Falcons have been like... Falcons have been like one of the more a very normal team. I know you're right. They do will let people down and they played some weird games, but overall it's like, they seem like a professional operation under Raheem Morris. They've got a professional quarterback, you know, the defense gets what it gets out of the defense, uh, out of the personnel they have. Uh, and the saints have just got a bit like the complete opposite, just a complete disaster this year. We will see if it'll be Mary Christmas or not in Nolens on Sunday afternoon. All right. Uh, I am up next. My next one, I am going to Arizona, where this is another kind of weirdly intriguing game. The Arizona Cardinals host the New York Jets. 
The Jets are one and a half point favorites in this game. We just talked about the AFC playoff picture. I mean, I think the Jets are done, but if you look at the standings, the Jets are weirdly not done. They're they're three and six here um, in the AFC. And so they've got a shot if they can win this game and prove to four and six. If the Colts lose, uh, if the Broncos lose, all of a sudden you're talking about a team that's one game out of that final wild card spot. So what I'm going with is Garrett Wilson over 66 and a half receiving yards. Garrett Wilson is third in the NFL in receiving yards, which I discovered about 20, you know, 40 minutes ago before we started this podcast. Now I know he's been targeted uh, a crazy amount. I'm not telling you he's the most efficient receiver in the NFL this year, but third in receiving yards, he's had at least eight targets in every game except one this season. And even last week, Devonte Adams is in there, but Garrett Wilson is just getting so many targets. So uh, Cardinals defense has been improved. I don't buy the Cardinals defense, but they have improved. I'll give them that they're getting more uh, than I thought they would get out of that personnel. But I actually think the Jets are going to be able to move the football here. And I think Garrett Wilson's going to be able to get over 66 and a half receiving yards. I kind of like the Jets uh, in this game to keep keep some of the hope alive uh, and win in Arizona. Yeah. I, and I think Wilson like has gotten a lot of those yards since Devontae Adams came over. Like he's averaging, I think he has like 240 receiving yards in the last three games. So that's kind of unlocked him in a way where I think it's freed him of the pressure of trying to be Devontae Adams now that they have the actual Devontae Adams there. And it's allowed him to run different routes. And I I, I think that's going to continue because I, I think he's like a top 10 receiver based on talent. We just haven't been able to see it, even though he does have the numbers apparently. And he had them even when he was getting uh, passes from Zach Wilson and, and Mike White. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you on this one. And I think the Jets might pull this one out. All right. There you go. All right, Ruiz, what's your second one? What do you got? Uh, I'm going to go to the Miami Los Angeles game. I'm going to take Devon A. Chain over five and a half receptions. He's had seven in each of the last couple of games. He gets most of his targets against zone coverage and LA is playing zone at the six highest rate in the NFL. So I think it's going to be one of those games where Mike McDaniel forces the Rams cornerbacks and their, their secondary uh, players to make tackles out in the flat. And a chain has been the guy that they've done that with this year. But I also wanted to point out that, that Tua Tagovailoa, his a dot is under six and it's been one of the higher a dots for the last couple of years. Now he's on pace for the lowest a dot of his career, going back to even pre Mike McDaniel times. So this offense has changed fundamentally. And I do wonder I wonder if they're going to lean into that more going forward or are they going to find a way to get that deep ball going again? Because that has been the key to their offense when it's been at its best. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Any theories? I know you haven't probably done like, all, but yeah, that is weird because it's sort of been even last week I looked up and he was what, like 25 for 28 or something, but they weren't, you know, consistently pushing the ball down the field. The yardage total was still pretty low. Is this a case of defense is taking something away? Is this like the guys coming off? Some serious injuries. Just let's get. The, I mean, even when he threw downfield before, he was getting the ball out pretty quickly. But uh, you know what I mean. Not having more plays where he might be holding holding the football back there. No, I feel like they are seeing different coverages. I think they're seeing more too high. But I, I don't know because it goes back to week one. Maybe it's like an offensive line thing. I, uh, I don't have an answer. But it's interesting that this has happened in year three. You would think that as he gets more comfortable in this offense. He that would go up and it hasn't this year. Yeah, I guess still a relatively small sample. Like if he plays yeah, the rest true. of the season, we'll see true. what yeah. it actually looks like there. Uh, I'm sticking with that game. Do you have anything from that game, Deontay? If not, I'll just knock out my third one here. No, I mean, I was the only thing that's really there to talk about is what uh, Stephen pointed out about Tua, right? And I think two weeks ago was one of the uh, lowest A dots that he's had, or excuse me, average time to throw that he's had in quite a while. And I do think that that's really what we're seeing more than anything is less play action. It feels like at times more drop back. And I think that for them, when you don't have the ability to push the ball deep down the field off the play action game, because teams are staying committed to keeping a roof, o roof over your offense, that does leave you in more of that dink and dunk mode. But I like, I like Steven's pick. I think that you're going to see them spread the ball out more to their playmakers in space. And that's been the best operation mode for this offense. And if they're able to make anybody miss, now it's just basically a punt return out there on the edge. And I think that that playing that way really behooves and benefits Miami's offense this week. Yeah, this could be a pretty fun Monday night game. Dolphins uh, at Rams. I'm sticking with that game for my third pick going on the other side of the ball. 
Cooper Cup over 63 and a half receiving yards. Um, so the Rams are one and a half point favorites in this game. And last week, Cooper Cup, obviously Nakua got thrown out of the game, but still Cooper Cup got 14 targets. Uh, I can't remember one of you. I think Deontay was a you who was talking about that in kind of the uh, Sunday night show that it just yeah. looks different. It feels different when Cooper Cup's out there uh, looking good and healthy. So he got targeted 14 times in that game, had 11 catches for 104 yards. I think this has a chance to be a, a shootout where a lot of points, certainly a lot of yards. I don't necessarily trust either defense, although that Rams defense uh, has been playing better the last three or four weeks of the season. But uh, I think their offense is going to move the ball with Matthew Stafford. And so I like Cooper Cup over 63 and a half receiving yards in that game. All right. Uh, where did Deontay? I think we got to get you yeah, at I've number two, one, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going with uh, Jordan Addison. 40 or more receiving yards versus that minus 102 playing up against this Jacksonville secondary. If there's one thing that Jacksonville's kind of had to resort to, it's selling out to stop the run because they just haven't been able to do much else defensively this year. And I think that for the most part, they've actually performed relatively well on a down to down basis. I want to say that they're top 10 in defensive stuff, uh, run stuff rate. And I want to say they're around like top 12, top 13 ish in a uh, defensive success rate against the run. If there's one thing we know about Minnesota's offense is that they invite defenses to play that way with all the condensed sets with getting multiple tight ends on in order to get those early down play action looks. I wouldn't be surprised if you see Tyson Campbell just mirroring wherever Justin Jefferson goes. And that leaves Jordan Addison now to be a move around piece. And if that safety in deep in the middle of the field is a, is spending most of his energy and a attention on Justin Jefferson that leaves a lot of space in the middle of the field for Jordan Addison to get loose on those over routes those crossing routes those curl routes in the open air where you can get those run after catch opportunities so I think that this will be a really good week for him to go off and if that's the case we'll probably see Sam Darnold get back to looking more effective the way that he did over the first five six weeks of the year and maybe not what we've seen recently where you get more of the sacks the fumbles and the bad throws in the traffic. Yeah, he's just got to avoid negative plays, I feel like, in this game because that's not a sound Jaguars defense. Now, <laughs> for most of the season, they're just playing man coverage, rushing with four, pressure doesn't get home, a corner gets beat. Last week yep. against the Eagles, they're trying to do some rotations to uh, cover two and the safety's rotating down and the other safety doesn't know he's got to rotate and all of it. It's like, what? No, there's too much space there. So yeah, I, I was not impressed with what I saw from them defensively uh, last week. I don't really know that they have a plan B and they don't have the horses to play the plan A that they want to play. The one way, you know, if John shines out, Allen, if Trayvon Walker, if those guys get after right. it and force a couple sack fumbles, that's the way I see this game being uh, closer. But man, the Jaguars, it looks like I think Mac Jones is probably going to start this game. That line ballooned up to Vikings uh, minus seven. and was like Vikings four and a half before. So I don't know. That one could get ugly. Ruiz in a hurry. Yeah. And my pick, my third pick is actually from the same game. It's okay. the same player too, Jordan Addison. Uh, but I'm going with longest reception over 18 and a half yards for a similar reason. I, we know the Jags are going to play man coverage. And if you're playing man coverage, you're going to have to throw some extra bodies at Justin Jefferson, especially on third down. And I think one thing Kevin O'Connell has done well, and we talked about this uh, earlier in the week is kind of use the gravity, Justin Jefferson's gravity to the other receivers advantage and, and dial up long plays for those guys. And I think we'll see at least one or two of those for Addison in this game. He caught a touchdown last week. I wouldn't be surprised if he scores again. I, I, I like him as a touchdown score. It's plus 250. That's more of a long shot. That's not my official pick going with the longest reception, but I do like that pick as well. Listen, when you're 19 and eight, the audience is going to want the book. Give out the bonus picks. I mean, if you want to give out 10, 20, whatever, the, they, they got to start uh, paying attention here. So I like Jordan. Now we're going to have to monitor Jordan. Now, now that is a sly move, though. That's I feel like that's a veteran move I would pull. You throw it out there, but you're not on the record for it. So now you get credit if it hits. If it doesn't hit, you say, I didn't even pick that as one of my iron. Right, I'm stealing. I'm, I'm doing that uh, approach next week. I like that one. It feels like something that should be in my playbook already. All right, Deontay, what do you have? What's your third one? So my last one is from uh, the Eagles Cowboys game. I'm going Jalen Hurts over 202 and a half passing yards. I think that you're going to see a Dallas defense, just like we talked about with Minnesota in the last game. Um, I think you're going to see a Dallas defense having a sellout to try to keep Saquon Barkley from just leaning on them and throwing those body blows snap after snap. And that's going to open up a lot of play action passing opportunity. I actually think that that's been 
And I, I know that we've been watching kind of Philadelphia navigate its way through this offensive kind of metamorphosis over the last month or so. And I think that really what they're landing on is an offensive approach that's just about trying to be effective with the run game on early downs and then just setting up these deep shots in the play action game and just allowing Jalen Hurts to use his deep downfield accuracy um, to punish defenses for trying to take away Saquon Barkley. I think that coming off of the last few weeks that we've seen from Dallas on the defensive end, this is the exact kind of defense you want to go up against. If that's your offensive approach, even if they are taking away Saquon Barkley and we see a less productive game for him, I don't think it'll come at the, uh, at the expense of the Eagles' offensive effectiveness because they should be out. They should have a lot of opportunities to attack deep downfield when they play the Cowboys. Yeah, that Cowboys defense just hasn't had answers for anything specifically against the run. I mean, I don't even know how many by they might have to go 12 men on the field to, <laughs> to, uh, as to stop the run. They really, I mean, they've had games like this before and we've put on this podcast. I remember us having conversations. I don't think they're going to be able to stop the run this week. And then we're watching the game on Sunday. Oh, 180 yards or, or something on the ground there. So yeah, Eagles have evolved into the most run heavy team in the NFL on early downs the last four weeks uh, since the bye. It's not like they've leaned into it a little bit. It's like they're going all That's the way. All they they do now. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned it, Deontay, the under center play action, which is like, this isn't the most novel concept in the NFL, but they did that five times last week. The most they've ever done it. Yeah, with that's Jalen big Hurts. for them. Like Jalen yeah, Hurts has gone like full seasons with no under yeah, center dropbacks. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah when, wonder, when they do it, it's like everyone stands up. <laughs> I wonder how much yelling it took from Kellen Moore in those meeting rooms of just begging and pleading. Like, please, give me two. Give me three. <laughs> and just slowly but surely, you're starting to see him kind of chip away at this kind of rigid, this rigid adherence to always doing everything out of the gun. So I think the more of that that we see, the better this offense gets. And it's kind of yeah. ironic that his opponent this week is Cooper Rush because it was sort of similar in Dallas because I don't think Dak is a quarterback that likes to go under center. He likes to be in the gun. He likes to do the drop back passing game. And when Cooper Rush got in there, when Dak was hurt, Kellen Moore was like, let's go under center. We're, we're spamming play action. And yeah. which I think Dallas's game plan should be, but I don't know if I trust Mike McCarthy to make that change because he is a guy who loves, you know, shotgun quick game. And there was a little spice with McCarthy and Kellen Moore this week. I don't know if you saw McCarthy was asked like about retaining Kellen Moore on his coaching staff. And he was kind of, he was like, I couldn't tell you if I would do that again. You know, like it was kind of like a, it wasn't, I don't, I didn't watch the clip, so I don't want to make it sound worse than it was. I read the quote, I think, um, in the athletic, but it was basically like when you're a new coach, like, would you rather just kind of have your people in there so that you can run your system versus remember Kellen Moore stayed on from the previous staff, coached the offense under McCarthy. And then after, uh, you know, before last year, McCarthy's like, get out of here. I want to run my stuff. And here we are a year later, not working out great for everyone's uh, favorite head coach, Mike McCarthy, Cooper rush in that game, a Cowboys team that is just like bottom quartile in pretty much any category you look at uh, in the NFL. So who knows what the next three, four weeks for the Dallas Cowboys are going to look like. All right. We got to everyone's picks, right? Should we do our, we'll do our reviews here. I can start us off here. My three picks, John feeling great about them. Never felt this good about my picks. What could go wrong? Uh, Jonathan Taylor under 81 and a half rushing yards, Garrett Wilson over 66 and a half receiving yards and Cooper cup over 63 and a half rushing yards. Deontay, what do you got? So I've got Falcons uh, as three and a half point favorites. I've got Jordan Addison with 40 or more receiving yards. And I've got Jalen Hurts going over 202 and a half passing yards. Ruiz. And I got a chain over five and a half receptions, Bills minus five and a half and Jordan Addison longest reception over 18 and a half. My boy, that Jordan Addison pop. On this episode right. of the Ringer NFL show, keep our eyes on him. I'll be keeping my eyes on Giants Panthers, a blockbuster, <laughs> huge, massive game, massive repercussions for the winner and loser of that football game in Munich. Bryce Young, Daniel Jones, let's international go. implications, an international, international implications. Affair. That's right. Who knows? The world Who knows? will be I watching. Know how far the implications will go? There's really no telling. We'll we'll just have to see on Sunday morning. All right. Thank you to Deontay Lee. Thank you to Stephen Ruiz. Appreciate Christopher Sutton producing. And Dan Comer, of course. I was just giving him a hard time about the record. We love a Dan Comer uh, on this podcast. We will be back on Sunday night for the recap show of Week 10 after we watch that fun 
Lions Texans game. Stay tuned for that. Everyone, enjoy the games this weekend. We'll talk to you next time on the Ringer NFL Show.